there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. Each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one Spirit. services, but the same Lord. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit, who allows to each one individually, just as the Spirit chooses. This is the time in our service when we turn to one another and offer the peace of Christ. Welcome to Old South Church. We hope and we pray that you feel at home in this house of God. We hope and we pray that the Spirit of God, the Spirit we have just sung of, we, we hope and we pray that the Spirit of God would come close to you here and the Spirit of God would come close to you now and would comfort you who are afflicted and would afflict you who are comfortable would enter into our trusting and would enter into our fearing and would enter into our letting go and and would enter into even our holding back. We hope and we pray that the Spirit of God would stir in you and, and would shape in you hope and faith and holy, bold intentions. 
take just a moment, if you would, and reach for the small black booklets near the aisle end of every pew. We ask that you would write to us now your name, and if you are new or new-ish around here, we ask that you would write us your email address too. If you leave your contact info with us, we will write you back this week and let you know how much it means that you have shared your Sunday morning in worship with us. Following worship this morning, join us in coffee hour, or if you are so inclined, gather with our new climate change working group on the fourth floor. We are exploring the work of greening our congregation and exploring other personal and in the public square sort of responses to God's charge that we care for and tend the creation. For now, let us worship in spirit and in truth.
from the book of Galatians. You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. May God add God's blessing to this reading. A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. First Timothy, second chapter, verses 11 and 12. As in all the congregations of the saints, women, should remain silent in churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. 1 Corinthians 14, 33 through 35. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church in Sencreae. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of his people and to give her any help she may need from you. For she has been the benefactor of many people, including me. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. Romans 16, 1 through 5. But the hour is now coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship God in spirit and in truth. For God seeks such, such as these to worship God. John 4, 23.
Nancy has come down with laryngitis and has no speaking voice. So while Nancy wrote the sermon that will be delivered today, she is not able to do so herself. She has turned to a friend for that, Dr. Sue Horner. Dr. Horner is scholar in residence at the American College of Greece, where her husband David is the president. David and Sue have been members of Old South Church for 10 years, though you probably haven't seen them around often as they spend most of their time in Athens. While Nancy is, as you can imagine, frustrated that she has no voice, she is delighted to introduce the Horners to the Old South family. David, are you out there? Would you raise your hand so we can welcome you? Hello. Welcome. Glad to have you. And Sue... Thank you for being here. Old South Church and the American College in Greece are no strangers to each other. Founded in 1875 by missionaries from Boston and supported by this church, the American College of Greece is the oldest and largest U.S. accredited college or university in Europe. Nancy has been there twice to visit the Horners and to renew the ties that bind this church to that college. Dr. Sue Horner holds an MTS from Harvard and she earned her Ph.D. at Northwestern in religion, feminism, and history, which makes her the perfect choice for presenting Nancy's sermon, Irregular. Women should remain silent in the churches. Ouch! They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission. Ouch! If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home. Ouch! <laughs> it, is dis- it, is a disgr- it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Ouch! So wrote the Apostle Paul, as represented in our New Testament, in the Epistle to the Corinthians. Or did Paul really write those verses? Now, you should know that the Apostle Paul is a huge figure in early Christianity. His letters to early Christian communities comprise a major portion of our New Testament. Paul is an enormously authoritative voice, and it's Paul who writes, Women should remain silent in the churches. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their husbands at home. Ouch. But wait a minute. Did Paul really write those lines? Are we sure? And don't think for a minute that these few verses haven't shaped the church across the millennia. Those verses lay the foundation, the justification, for all the patriarchal churches, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant. After all, no less an authority than Paul wrote, it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Ouch. But did Paul really write these lines? There's a lot of scholarly suspicion that Paul didn't write those sentences, that they were inserted, snuck in much later, that they are a later interpolation, that they are fraudulent, a forgery, that someone posing as Paul, assuming the identity of Paul, pretending to be Paul, maybe some anonymous monk. Imagine this monk in a dark monastery, third or fourth century bent over a desk, copying a manuscript by candlelight, furtively slipping in these verses when no one is looking. Maybe this monk hated his mother. Or maybe, maybe at a tender age he was spurned by a girl to whom he had taken a fancy. Or maybe, maybe this young monk was an underachiever and calculated that if he could eliminate half the competition, that might give him edge he needs to get ahead in the church. In any case, there's good reason to suspect that Paul never wrote those awful verses, verses that have done untold harm across the centuries. Why do I say this? On what evidence? Because those verses directly contradict an earlier passage in the very same letter in which Paul celebrates women's prayers and prophecy in church. And because in other letters written by Paul, for instance, his letter to the Romans, perhaps Paul's most influential letter, Paul writes sentiments like this, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deacon of the church. A deacon? 
How do you get to be a deacon and not speak? Deacons serve the bread and cup of Christ's communion table. Deacons say the most important words we utter in church. The bread of heaven broken for you. The cup of salvation poured out for you. Oh, and deacons baptize. How do you baptize without speaking? Without invoking the Trinity? Without I baptize you in the name of? And note this, when Paul describes Phoebe as a deacon, he employs the same word, exactly the same word in Greek, diakonos. The very same word that he uses when he refers to Timothy as a deacon. And it's the same word Paul uses in regards to his own ministry. In other words, Phoebe is no deaconette, no subdeacon, no underdeacon, no vice or junior deacon, no deacon in training, no deaconess light. There is nothing diminutive or lesser, nothing reduced about Phoebe's role. Phoebe is diakonos, the real deal, the full deacon. There's more. Elsewhere in this letter to the Romans, Paul writes this. Greet Priscilla and Aquila. Stop there, right there. Priscilla and Aquila, a married couple. Priscilla the wife, Aquila the husband. Not only here but elsewhere, Paul names Priscilla ahead of Aquila. It's the equivalent today, really, of replacing Greek Mr. and Mrs. John Smith to Greek Mrs. and Mr. Jane Smith. Oh, and note this. Paul calls both of them my co-workers in Christ Jesus. From the beginnings of early Christianity, from its earliest days, women were important. Women were leading members of this fledgling movement. Women played prominent roles in Jesus' ministry. There were women disciples at the foot of the cross. Women were reported to be the first witnesses to the resurrection. As time went on, groups of Christians organized within the homes of believers. Those who could offer their home for meetings were held in high esteem and assumed leadership roles. Women such as the sisters, Mary and Martha, such as Lydia of Philippi, a wealthy dealer in purple cloth, such as Phoebe, Chloe, and Rufus's mother. By building up her own house church, a woman could rise to leadership, improve her social status, and gain in both power and dignity in the early Christian movement. All of which is to say that those few verses, those offending and offensive verses in the epistle to the Corinthians, are outliers, aberrations, anomalies. They go against the grain. They contradict the preponderance of Paul's other writings in which he affirms women's roles as leaders, as leaders who held roles and responsibilities in every way equal to those of men. Which is why, 44 years ago today, on July 29, 1974, some women and men of the Episcopal Church in America took it upon themselves, because the Episcopal Church itself wasn't ready, took it upon themselves to right an old wrong, to begin to ordain women to the Episcopal priesthood. They scheduled an ordination service on July 29th in the year 1974. Eleven qualified women deacons presented themselves for ordination that day. Three retired bishops were prepared to break ranks with the church and to take it upon themselves to do the deed. Appropriately, the ordination service was held on the feast of Saints Martha and Mary. Equally appropriately, it was held at the Church of the Advocate in Philadelphia. The church was packed, filled with 2,000 worshipers, mostly supporters, with a few protesters. Harvard University professor Charles V. Willie, who was also the vice president of the Episcopal House of Deputies, preached the sermon. It was entitled, The Priesthood of All Believers. He began, The hour cometh, and now is when the true worshipers shall worship God in spirit and in truth. Dr. Willie, himself African American, declared, as, blocks, as blacks refused to participate in their own oppression by going to the back of the bus in 1955 in Montgomery, women are refusing to cooperate in their own oppression by remaining on the periphery of full participation in the church. In the middle of the service, as part of the rite of ordination, one of the bishops said, if there be any of you who knoweth any impediment or notable crime in these women, let them come forth in the name of God. 
At that point, several priests proceeded to read aloud their statements against the ordinations. Once these statements had been made, the bishops responded that they were acting in obedience to God. Hearing God's command, we can heed no other. The time for our obedience is now. They proceeded with the ordinations, 44 years ago today. Following the ordinations, the Episcopal House of Bishops declared the ordinations invalid. But wait, the House of Bishops' hurried declaration that the ordinations were invalid was overruled. It was overruled by astute theological and ecclesiastical experts who declared that the ordinations were in no way invalid. Indeed, they met all the criteria. One, they had been performed by bishops in good standing. Two, they had been performed according to the ordination rite in the Book of Common Prayer. Three, they had been performed by the laying on of hands within the apostolic succession. And four, the deacons who had presented themselves for ordination were in every way prepared and ready. And so these ordinations were rebranded, not invalid, but irregular. And so they remain. The women ordained that day, dubbed the Philadelphia Eleven, were and remain irregularly ordained but ordained, fully, legally, ecclesiastically ordained. There are several morals to this story. First, don't believe everything you read, even if it's in the Bible. Second, beware of the anonymous 4th century monk who without proper supervision presumed to improve upon the Apostle Paul. A forgery will be exposed. Third, retired bishops have more courage than acting bishops. Fourth, in our congregational tradition, we have been ordaining women since 1853, which makes the United Church of Christ not better, but certainly more agile than the Episcopal Church. Fifth, it is both imperative and possible to test to probe, to inspect our sacred texts, to ask questions, to challenge, to compare, and dissect them. We can ask, does this ring true? Is it inwardly consistent? We can ask, is it expansive? Is this passage and its meaning as deep and wide and high as the God whom we ourselves have met in Christ Jesus? We can ask, is there room here for everyone? Some of the verses that pass those tests are on page four in your bulletins. The first listed there is from the Epistle to the Galatians. I invite you now to rise in body or in spirit. And in honor of the Philadelphia 11, in honor of the Church of the Advocate, in honor of the three retired bishops who did the deed, let us read it together. You are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is no Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor And let the people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
also with you. May the peace of Christ dwell in your hearts. Christ is our peace, our light, and our hope. Let us pray. Holy God, we come before you feeling small, knowing that we have sinned in what we have thought or said, or in the times we should have spoken up but did not do so. We think of the moments we should have acted but made up reasons to remain passive. Forgive us. Merciful God, you who give grace and forgiveness in abundance, we pray that you might make us the recipients of your gifts over and over again. Help us to accept your grace and to find freedom in your love. Wash over us now. Creator God, we pray for the world in thanksgiving for the fruit it bears, for the homes it offers, for the beauty it beholds. And we pray in awe and in fear of the powers that nature holds. We pray especially for California and Greece as they face death and destruction from wildfires. We pray for the American College in Greece, whose staff, faculty, and alumni are among the dead and the missing and have lost homes and property. Savior God, give hope to those who have lost sight of who they are. Bring healing to those who suffer. Bring light to those who sit in darkness. Bring peace to those in turmoil. We trust that you know what is happening in our lives. You who knew us even before we were formed in our mother's womb. And so, we simply lift up names of our beloved, entrusting them into your care. Emily and Rodney. Eleanor. Jamie. Kelsey, Bob and Diane, Barbara, Russ, God, our teacher, you have called us to live by your ways, to love one another as you love us. You teach us anew, day by day, what it means to live righteously and mindfully. As we continue this journey of loving and learning, we find comfort in the words that Jesus taught us, praying together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. 
and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It was an extravagant offering. Mary, Mary, a prophet woman, as the hymn we have sung put it, Mary poured out costly perfume at the feet of Jesus, symbolically anointing him for burial. In all, the perfume she poured out would have cost a year's wages. But think of the fragrance. Think of the smell of that perfume in the air. On his walk to Calvary, on his walk to the cross, through the crowds, in his last days and in his dying, there would have been a lingering fragrance. There would have been a little of that loveliness in the air. And when we give, when we give extravagantly, when our hearts well up and overflow and we pour out all we have and all we are, there is again a loveliness in the air. As the Apostle Paul, the real one, as he writes in 2 Corinthians, through us, God spreads everywhere the fragrance that comes from knowing him. For we are the very aroma of Christ. The morning's offering will now be given and received.
As you've probably seen in your bulletin, today is Eleanor Jensen's 100th birthday. Uh, is it today, actually? Yes. It is today, this very day. Uh, and she is watching us on our live stream. We have, Nancy has just now delivered this confirmation. We're live to Eleanor Jensen's apartment over on Mass Ave. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is to stand if you are able and turn around. We're going to sing happy birthday to Eleanor uh, on such an auspicious day as this. Hit it, Mitchell.
word for irregular is extraordinary. Thank you to Sue for taking us from irregular to extraordinary on this day. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God look upon you with kindness and give you peace this day and every day. And let the whole church say, Amen. Amen.